All right, guys, hopefully you've already seen our first video in this series on how to become a farmer. You got your business plan made up. You figure out just exactly how you're going to take the plunge into row crop farming. Hopefully you've already found an ideal situation, maybe even picked up your uh, first pieces of equipment, and hopefully you've even picked up your first piece of ground. Now, where do you go from there? Well, in this video, we're going to uh, try to cover a lot of what you need to consider agronomically so you can make sure that your very first crop is a success. And then finally, our third video will deal about the business aspects that you need to consider in running your farm. So anyway, right after the intro, we'll dive into the agronomy and uh, let you know the things you really need to look for and pay attention to first off. All right, you've picked up your first piece of ground and you're looking forward to putting your first crop in. So what do you need to consider before you actually put some seed into the ground? Well, if you just picked up your first farm and you don't have any other history farming, most likely that first piece of ground is probably going to be a piece of ground that really nobody else wanted to work. Maybe it's small, maybe it's cut up, maybe it's highly eroded, maybe it's surrounded by tree lines, uh, very unproductive fields. And there's a reason someone rented it to you because nobody else wanted to work it. That's a very common occurrence. And even with me, you know, I'm getting ready to put in my 18th crop. I still get approached with that, that type of land. And for the most part, I'd usually pick it up because that's one thing that I really uh, specialize in is bringing poor farms back to life and making them productive. You know, it's very doubtful that your first piece of land is going to be a nice piece of uh, ice cream dirt, maybe a nice big flat bottom, you know, capable of producing 200, 250 bushels of corn. You know, the fertility and the pH is real high on it and everything just lines up right. Very doubtful that's going to happen. So anyway, before you even think about what your first crop is going to be, there are some things you need to look at on your land and start the process of getting them repaired because most likely there's going to be some issues on that farm and my advice would be very first thing you pay attention to is your soil i mean this is the medium that you're going to be growing crops in and if your soil is not right it's really really hard to produce profitable crops let alone good crops uh, the very first thing you need to do and hopefully you've even, you've got an idea of it before you even agree to rent the land is you need to find out what the pH on your soil is. Typically before I even uh, submit a bid to rent a piece of ground, I'll just go out and I'll pull just a couple of random soil samples. I'll send them all so I have a rough idea of what the pH and the fertility is on that land. So I've got an idea of how much it's going to cost me to bring that uh, soil back to life to make it pro to, to make it productive it also might give kind of give me a hint of what kind of yields I can expect off of it because the last thing I want to do is bid real high on a piece of ground just to secure it and then find out I got to sink thousands of dollars into uh, lime and fertilizer to rebuild the productivity of that farm and because those things take time there would be a good chance of me actually losing money the first uh, few years that I farmed it. So anyway, the first thing that I would do is I would uh, get with your local co-op or your, your chemical supplier, somebody that deals in precision ag. It could even be an independent agronomist. In fact, it might be better that if it's an independent agronomist, but get the boundaries on the, uh, your first farm and go ahead and lay off some grid soil sampling points on it. Uh, I would highly recommend two and a half acre grids. Uh, the more the more soil, the more soil sample points that you have, the better and the more accurate it's going to be. But uh, you know, if you got a bunch of uh, maybe small cut up fields in a farm, uh, the more points you can have, the better. Uh, two and a half acres is generally what we do. I'd love to do maybe one acre. Uh, grids uh, get me that much more data but for the most part two and a half acre grids does us a good job and then go out and pull uh, soil samples on each point or have your independent uh, uh, consultant go out and pull, uh, pull pull those soil samples 
And then once you get those in, you've got a very good idea of what the pH, the fertility, the organic matter is as it's going across the field. Whereas if you just pull one or two soil samples, that's just kind of giving you an average of the farm. Whereas you might have some really hot spots in your field that's got a really low pH. And if you just put just a standard rate of lime, that's not going to be enough to really improve that ground. So I really encourage you to start out by grid soil sampling. And the very first thing that you need to look at when you get those soil samples back is you need to look at the pH. Because if you've got too low of a pH, it doesn't matter what else you do to the soil, it's not really going to improve it. If you've got really acidic soil, no matter how much fertilizer you put on that ground, it's not going to be available for your crop to take up. So the very first thing you need to do is to correct the pH on your ground. So go ahead and get your uh, soil samples back, figure up how much lime you need and go ahead and hire somebody to get that lime put out on your, that farm as soon as possible because lime is not instantaneous. It's not like applying nitrogen fertilizer. Uh, it takes, you know, three, four, five years to really get the full effect of the lime. And even though I'm not a proponent of tillage, if your pH is bad enough and you have to put a lot, a lot of lime on your soil, you know, say two, three, four tons per acre, you might really want to consider some deep tillage to work that lime down into the soil to quickly, uh, to, to quickly change the pH on your soil. And if you have to do that, have to do that tillage, it's also a really good time for you to go ahead and maybe fix some problems uh, that, that might be uh, occurring on your farm, maybe with some e erosion problems. Maybe you need to add some terraces or some silt basins. Maybe you need to do some land clearing, clear out some tree lines or something like that. That would also be a good time to go ahead and get that stuff done on your farm. Do one tillage pass on it or two tillage passes, whatever it takes to get the ground smooth, level, make it where it's draining good. And then you can start your no-till program after that, but you also have the benefit of that you've worked the lime down into the soil. Uh, you kind of mixed it through the soil layers and you can quickly raise the pH up on there. And then if you keep up on your pH as you keep on farming, you can just add lime to the top. You know, say soil sample, we soil sample every three years and add lime appropriately there. And then that way that'll kind of keep you with a nice baseline pH as you go throughout your farming career. So starting off your first year, if you're dealing with a really low pH, I really wouldn't invest very much money in fertilizer. It really doesn't matter what the soil samples come back for because chances are you've got fertility in the soil. It's just not available to the plants and you're gonna apply the lime to unlock a lot of that fertility in the soil. So if you're dealing with a limited budget, which you probably are, I would dedicate most of my budget to getting the soil right, you know, maybe building any structures, applying lime, doing any kind of land clearing. Spending your money that way that first year will lead you to the greatest chance of, uh, to the greatest chance of actually getting some money back that first year. Now, say uh, your pH is pretty decent. Maybe you got a few hot spots and you just need to variable rate apply your lime in a few hot spots, but your fertility is low. Well then by all means, you know, if you've got the money, go ahead and invest in infertility, your uh, phosphorus, your potassium. And uh, for that, uh, since you probably don't have a lot of agronomic experience, uh, a good resource would be, you know, if you're working for a farmer, you know, ask what he does to his farms. Your uh, university extension would be another good resource of giving you some pretty standard rates of what you need to apply to your soils to achieve whatever types of yields that you're wanting to do. And then going from there, make sure every decision having to do with that farm going forward, make sure it's not going to be something that's really going to, to degrade the soil. So you have to get in there and plant. Uh, try to make, make sure the ground's right. Make sure you're not going to get into the field and make a mess by either compacting the soil or rutting it up or causing problems that you're going to have to come back later on and fix. It's always better to wait a little bit on an operation and uh, make sure your ground's right, you're not doing any damage to the soil, than to uh, get in there and mud it in and, and do whatever you're doing before conditions are ideal. Now, when talking about farming practices, there's a lot of different roads you can go down. Uh, and I'm not gonna tell you which way you need to go because it's completely dependent on your environment your, and your location. 
what I would say would be to start off with, with whatever is predominantly the most popular practices in your area, because that will give you the least chance of failure because it's been tried and true. If that's a conventional tillage system and your ground is not highly erodible, well then start off with a conventional system and go from there as you gain knowledge and experience about what's best for your farms. You know, I'd highly encourage you to try a no-till system first because in my opinion, for the majority of the world, a no-till system is probably going to be the best system because anytime you disturb the soil, you are going to be hurting soil structure and you're going to be hurting the microbial, the, all the biological life in that soil that can really help to boost your crops. Now I know no-till is not going to fit everywhere, but for the most part, there have been people all across the world that have tried it in a huge variety of situations and they have made it work. So it is possible for a lot of locations. And if the ground is as poor as what there's a good chance that it might be, I would also encourage you to look into cover crops after you harvest your first crop to more quickly build your soil back up, to add organic matter to the soil, to recycle nutrients, maybe bring some nutrients from deep down in the soil to bring them up towards the, the top to where they're more uh, better utilized by, by your cash crop, to increase your water infiltration rate, to increase your water holding capacity on, on your farm. Uh, there's just a whole host of benefits that cover crops can give you. Again, it might not be suitable for every part of the world, but I would encourage you to at least look into it and see if there's a way that you can fit cover crops in onto your field. As you can tell, we're in the middle of winter. We're still in a nice green lush field of cover crops. We just got over two inches of rain uh, last night and, and the ground's a little squishy, but there's not any water standing out here. That's how much that we've increased the uh, a porosity and the soil structure of our soils to quickly infiltrate the rain to where it's down in the soil and then it can be utilized. If it runs off into a creek behind me, it's not going to be doing anybody any good. Plus it's going to be carrying valuable nutrients and other properties of your soil into the creek and down the creek into a river somewhere. All right, we've talked a lot about the soil because it's one of the most important things you need to consider above all things. All right, you're uh, getting ready to put in your first crop. What do you plant? My advice to you on this would be, don't put all of your eggs in one basket. Uh, one of the key strategies in farming is to mitigate as much risk as you can. If you plant just one crop, your chances of failure are a whole lot higher than if you were to plant two crops or three crops. The more crops you plant divides the risk among those crops because they're all developed differently and they all develop at different times. You might encounter a month-long drought that might say severely hurt your hurt that might say severely hurt a corn crop, but then you catch a rain later on because soybeans are a little bit later maturing, maybe they catch the rain at the right time and you can still produce an income, a crop off of a soybean crop. Uh, same way with cotton. You know, and depending on your area, you know, there's gonna be popular crops that are grown. But even if all you're able to pick up your first year is a 10 acre piece of land, at the very least divide it into two crops because you don't wanna put all your eggs in one basket. And then when I'm going into a year and planting crops, you know, I've got my eye on what the market price is for those crops. But, I, but if one crop is looking really, really good in January and February, I don't go with a large percentage of my acres in that one crop hoping that it'll pay off at the end of the year because I don't know what the growing season is going to be like all throughout the year. Yeah, that one commodity might have a real high price, but if I don't make anything of that commodity, well, I've, I've lost my rear end, whereas I, might, I would have been better off with planting two commodities. And even though there might be a lower price for that second commodity, there's a better chance of it actually producing yield. So no matter if you got, got, it doesn't matter if you just got 10 acres, plant five acres of corn and five acres of soybeans or you know five acres and five acres of whatever popular crops are grown in your area. But at the same time, because you're just getting started out in farming, uh, labor's probably not gonna be a problem for you. You're gonna be out there working your tail off to make sure you're successful that first year. It might not be a bad idea to maybe consider a little bit of a specialty crop if there's a market available in your area for that crop. You know, whether it's, uh, 
peanuts, uh, whether it's canola, or maybe vegetable crops, sweet corn, you know, all of those are going could, could potentially be higher valued crops and could give you a better return on your investment, especially if you're dealing with a real small acreage. Now, when you get into specialty crops, there might be a little bit more risk involved, but if you only plant an acre or two acres of it, just something to give you maybe a little additional income off that piece of ground, it might wanna be some, something that you look at rather than just say going with a standard corn and soybeans, wheat or, or cotton or, or, or whatnot. But before you do decide to go with a specialty crop and make dang sure that you've got a market for it because there's not anything worse than producing a good crop and not being able to sell it though. What else do you need to consider? Well, consider what you think that your ground is actually capable of growing. If you're uh, dealing with a uh, some really highly eroded ground, maybe doesn't have a lot of good topsoil on it, well, corn's probably not gonna be a good option for you because corn needs good deep soils. It needs a lot of water holding capacity cause uh, middle of the summer, it's using a lot of water water per week. So uh, make sure that the crop you plan to plant is suitable for it. Uh, you might have a nice little field, but it's surrounded on all sides by tall trees. It might have a heavy deer population in there. Well, in that case, soybeans might not be that good because uh, the deer just constantly have an all day buffet to come in there and eat your soybeans. Going back to that thin eroded ground, uh, you want to plant something other than soybeans, corn's not a good option. Well, maybe you need to look at grain sorghum if uh, you got a market available for grain sorghum in your area and grain sorghum is, is adapted to, to your area. And maybe look at cotton, especially if you're at a southern uh, uh, latitude to where cotton's actually grown, uh, cotton might be a better option for your drought or your soils. Again, make sure that you uh, plant a crop that is suitable for your land, especially that first year that gives you the best chance for success. But in reality, one of the things that can help you out most just getting out started in farming is having a trusted mentor on advising you of how you need to handle certain situations when raising a crop because you will encounter situations every single year. Even if it's a good growing season, there will be certain situations that you need to handle the right way to ensure your profitability. And I think probably one of the best resources that you can have could uh, potentially be the farmer that you're working for or that you've worked for in the past and has been successful. They've encountered a lot of things and they can probably give you a lot of advice if they're willing to mentor you. I would strongly advise you to hire an independent crop consultant to scout your crop and give you recommendations, preferably one that is well trusted in the industry. Because uh, it's, it's really hard when you're growing your own crop and you're out there looking at your crop and you see something that either you're not sure about, you're having problems identifying, or you're just really not sure what the right call is, you've got a lot of emotion in that decision because it, it determines whether you're gonna be successful or not. And you can agonize on deciding whether to apply a certain product or spray for insects or, or whatnot. You can agonize on that for quite a while. And it really makes the decision process difficult. But if you've got an independent crop consultant, they can go out there and they don't have any emotion in there. They want to see you do well because they want to see you, see you stay in business, but they don't have any of the invested uh, energy and work in actually producing that crop. And they can look at uh, your crop with a more critical eye and have a clearer decision and really help guide you through that decision-making process. And while I think there's a lot of good resources with your local retailers, keep in mind that it's their job to sell you stuff. That's how they make their money is by selling you stuff. Now, while you can get some really good advice from local retailers, especially if you've got a good working relationship with them and you trust them, always keep in the back of the mind that more than likely they're gonna recommend that you apply something and it may or may not solve your problems. So that's where I think an independent crop consultant can be very critical in your operation. And the key to success in growing uh, profitable, high yielding crops is identify what is your limiting factor on production. Because you can address a lot of issues in your crop, but if it's not the most limiting factor in your production, really not gonna help yield that much. Yeah, your corn might be a little low on nitrogen and you see that maybe in some tissue tests or just by the color of the plant, but if you got an even lower level of phosphorus or potassium, or you've got disease in your crop, 
that might be limiting it more than nitrogen. So applying extra nitrogen might not raise yield that much until you address that uh, most limiting factor first. So this isn't really something you can necessarily do the first year going into it because it takes experience of knowing how crops respond on a certain piece of ground under certain conditions. But start off that first year really studying your crop. Uh, really study what you do to your crop and how your uh, crop responds to what you did to hopefully where in the future, if you're able to make it to a second, third, or fourth year, that you can start identifying that most, uh, the, the most limiting part of your production to where you can address it in season before it's too late. And one of the most important things I'm gonna cover finally that you need to do starting off year one is record keeping. You need to keep meticulous records of what you've done to your farm every step of the way. Uh, every variety that you plant, every fertilizer application, every trip across the field. Keep very meticulous records because you're gonna rely on those records later on to at the end of the year to help you determine what you did right and what you did wrong. Because every year is a learning experience. Doesn't matter how much experience you have, every year is a learning experience. And when you get done harvesting a crop in October or November, sometimes it's hard to remember exactly what you did in March and April that really might have made a difference in the outcome of your crop. So keep meticulous records. There's a lot of ways to do it. I mean, you can keep handheld records. Uh, nothing wrong with that. I myself, I prefer digital records. There's a lot of spreadsheets that I use to keep track of uh, inputs and work out different scenarios in my field. But my, my favorite way of keeping records is a uh, digital record keeping platform specifically geared towards agriculture. And there's quite a few out there. Uh, myself, I use Ag Studio, uh, made by MapShots. It's a, uh, it, it's now a Corteva product, it, but it tra tracks all of my trips across the field, what I'm doing on each trip. I can assign costs to the products that I use. And not only does it help me agronomically keep track of my records, but it also, from a business sense, helps me keep track of my cost. And at the end of the year, I can go back and analyze. You know, I can over, I can overlay uh, my harvest maps with my planting maps, or maybe some other maps to maybe try and figure out why I had a problem area in the field and identify what that problem was, so I can fix that problem for for future years. Again, there's a lot of different programs out there that you can choose from. Uh, research them all and try to pick out the one that's best for you. Now, a lot of those programs, I mean, they're not necessarily cheap, especially if you're dealing with a small acreage like yourself. So this might be an opportunity for, to, for you to maybe start a little bit of a side business to bring in a little extra income. Uh, you can use a lot of these programs to write uh, variable rate prescriptions to keep track of people's records and maybe uh, write uh, you know, prescriptions for them, whether they're planting prescriptions or fertility prescriptions or lime prescriptions. There's a lot of different ways you can do that. If you took my advice from the first video and you're currently working for a farmer, maybe that farmer uh, doesn't feel comfortable with uh, himself keeping up with records digitally and producing his own prescriptions and he's letting a retailer or an independent consultant produce those uh, prescriptions for him. That might be an opportunity for you to uh, have someone else to help pay for the cost of that program. You learn the ins and outs of that, that program and then you also provide a service for somebody else that will then benefit your farm. Because believe it or not, there's really not a whole lot of farmers out there that do all of that stuff themselves, keep track of all of their own records digitally, uh, their yield maps, their soil maps, uh, their fertility maps, uh, their soil sampling maps, and then write their own prescriptions. A lot of uh, farmers will let another party do that for them because they haven't actually invested the time into learning the software themselves to where they can do it themselves. And uh, anytime a farmer pays another company to do that for them, I mean, they're paying out money that they could sa save themselves. And additionally, if you do it yourself, that's money you're saving. Or if you're doing it for somebody else, that's added in extra income coming into your pocket to help supplement your farming. All right, guys, I know I covered a lot of ground here in a short amount of time, but I really probably didn't cover as much ground as what I needed to. But that just kind of gives you a rough idea of maybe the more important points that you need to consider before you ever put in your first crop to hopefully ensure that your first crop 
is a success. And again, I can't tell you specifically the things that you need to look for. Uh, I can just kind of give you some guidelines, some uh, rough overview, but uh, my advice is the most critical thing is to build connections in your community with people that you trust, people that have been successful with in the past, and, and lean on them heavily about the uh, specific things you need to look for, you know, with the type of ground that's in your area, with the type of crops that, that's in your area, uh, but also uh, but also there's a lot of resources uh, online too that uh, can really help you learn a lot and again don't dismiss your uh, local university extension uh, they might not always have the best recommendations out there but in my opinion they've got some pretty solid recommendations that's a really good starting point for your farm so anyway guys i guess i'm gonna wrap it up here i really appreciate i really appreciate you watching this video hopefully you found it informative uh, hopefully you picked up some good tips from it, some things to look for. And, uh, 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 but be sure to catch our next video where I'm going to dive into a lot of the business decisions uh, that you need to consider when farming, which might actually be more important than the agronomic decisions that you will face in farming. So thanks guys. See you in the next one.